uh, remind us in such things. Uh, nothing new, no new announcement, but just remind us. Uh, there's a project milestone that's due today. Today is the 20th, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a project milestone that's due today. It is uh, those of you who have done it will attest to the fact that it was really easy and uh, really required no effort to the point where I got messages from students asking, is this it? Uh, yes, this is it. Um, uh, so please get it done. Um, and there's a homework that's available on Canvas. Uh, you get a week for it. It's due next Tuesday. Uh, it's a quiz in that, uh, meaning that it's uh, it's like homework zero. You get two attempts at it. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, at the end of the two attempts, whichever is the higher score, that's what we'll keep. And the goal of this particular homework is to kind of make you go back to the beginning of the semester and revisit the content. And this way, as you're preparing for the midterm, this can kind of uh, help you get comfortable with the entire uh, semester, with all the material we've covered so far. And uh, speaking of the midterm, there's a midterm in class next Thursday right here. Um, and uh, it will cover everything that we would have done this week. So whatever is uh, done till the end of Thursday is uh, uh, will be what's covered in the midterm. Any questions about any of these things? Yes. That's yeah, yeah. It's called the project information quiz on Canvas. Whatever is due today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think did I call the second thing milestone one? Yeah. So I think you are not supposed to call milestone. Okay. So this is milestone zero then. Yeah. Yes. We count from zero today. Other questions. This part of the class is a little dark, so if you raise your hand, if you have a question, raise it a little higher so that I don't miss it. Um, is homework three open book? Well, it is open book because it is uh, homework. All homeworks are, by definition, homework book, uh, open book. Yes. And of course, it's not timed or anything. It's, uh, it's just you get access. You have... Uh, um, yeah, so there's another question. The results of the quiz from homework three are muted. Is this intentional? I don't understand the question. Do you know what's going on? Ah, okay, okay. So uh, the way I think I've set it up, and there's a chance that I've gotten it wrong. Maybe my DS can help me fix it. The way my goal is, you get two attempts at it. At the end of the first attempt, you are told uh, which questions you got wrong, but not what the right answers are. Um, and I, I think that's what the instructions say. And at the end, after that, the second attempt, uh, you have to think about the question again. And there's a possibility because of there's some randomization that if you get a question wrong or right in the first attempt, in the second attempt, you may not see the same question again um, because uh, there's some randomness uh, in the generation of the questions. But uh, the intention is that the answers are not visible until you finish both attempts. I think until everyone finishes both attempts. So until uh, Tuesday. And from the student view, uh, it says uh, we cannot see the quiz score as well as which questions we got wrong. So um, we will fix it. Uh, maybe my TA can uh, help me fix it because I always get this wrong. Um, Canvas has like about eight options and that is two power eight possible combinations. Um, and you know some of them are not particularly well described. So we'll try to get it right. Okay, other questions? Yes. Is there a way to pause the quiz and come back to it? I truly don't know. Is uh, the, the others can help me with this because yes. It's kind of like leave it for however long come back. Oh, you just leave the browser tab open. I yeah, I mean, the best I can ask, offer is if you think that it's not uh, working, then file a support ticket to Canvas because I didn't make it, I didn't break it. Um, I don't know. Seriously, Canvas can sometimes do the right thing. Um, that's the most charitable thing I can say. Other questions? Okay, if there are no questions, um, we're going to dive back into computational learning theory. In the last lecture, 
Um, just to kind of give you a sense of where we are. We talked about computational learning theory. We talked about, in the last lecture, we talked about uh, what a theory of generalization might look like, what kinds of things it might connect. And I started talking about this idea of pack learning, or rather the, the what we might uh, expect from any learning framework, any learning algorithm. And the two sort of driving intuitions for pack learning are, the first uh, are in some sense relaxations of two kinds of expectations. The first one is, it's entirely possible that we do not recover the target concept exactly. There is a target concept that nature has hidden from us. And rather than providing that function to you, uh, then the nature provides a set of labeled examples. Now, the thing is, any set of labeled examples is necessarily finite. And unless you have a discrete space where you have all possible combinations of examples that are available, it's entirely possible that your uh, learner uh, encounters a subset of all possible examples. And there will be multiple functions that are consistent with the same, uh, with this particular set of uh, examples. This means your learning algorithm can choose one function as the, as the true function because it's consistent with all the examples. And it's entirely possible that nature has chosen a different function that's also consistent with the same set of examples. We've seen an example, we've seen an instantiation of this in I think the second lecture in the semester. So it's entirely possible that uh, you might get very unlucky in your choice of uh, in, in what your learner does, and it, you, your learner is going to make mistakes in the future. So we have to live with possible mistakes in the future. The best we can hope for is rather than uh, expecting zero mistakes in the future, we can hope for few mistakes in the future, few errors. So the expectation here is rather than a perfect uh, classifier, we'll just uh, agree to misclassify rare examples. And if, if that happens, we will count that as a success. That's the first sort of relaxation uh, of our expectations. The second point here is even this situation where we can make we get a close approximation of the true function, even this situation might not always happen. You get a finite training set. And maybe today is your unlucky day and you got a really bad training set, an unrepresentative training set consisting only of examples that never occur later on. And the most common examples don't show up in your data or the most common kinds of examples don't show up in your data. As a result, your classifier makes mistakes most of the time in the future. This is a different sort of a uh, concession that we are making. The first one is saying that I'm willing to live with an error. My The classifier or the model that I train is not going to be perfect. The second one that says, the second concession is even the expectation of a small error might not always be satisfied. And it's possible that you just get unlucky and you, you don't get a close approximation. This is roughly where we uh, left off. Are there any questions? Let's pick up from here. What we can hope for is any learner is a good learner if with high probability it gives you a close approximation of the true concept. If this happens, we will count it as a win. Remember, we are talking about formalizing the notion of learning. And all we are saying here is, what, is, what do we count as successful learning? In mistake bound learning, we decide, define successful learning as the learner stops making mistakes after making a polynomial number of them. In this framework, we are defining success as, with high probability, we will get a close approximation of the true function. This is the, this is the framework that PAC seeks to formalize. Let's uh, let's uh, put some symbols here. Um, uh, everything that I'm going to say next is just a formal definition that captures that sentence up there. So if you don't, if you have any questions about that, let's get that out of the way first. Yes. Uh, actually, the, the second 
So let's just give some numbers here. You're calling this one and this is two, right? So the last last C. Okay. The last, yeah, it's the other. This one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the other one. We could not get a very it's possible we could not get a very high possibility, right? And then that's why we said we get a very high possibility. <laughs> so this is the opposite situation. This is what we don't want to happen. It is possible that we don't learn the true concept. We will define success as this situation happening in frequently. Oh. This situation happens with low probability. If this situation happens with low probability, then with high probability, mm -hmm. you'll get a close approximation of the uh, true concept. Okay. So we need to now just to, to start formalizing this. We need to put. We need to give some, uh, get some symbols in the mix because nobody will believe that this is math if you don't throw in some Greek. So let's have these two symbols, epsilon and delta. We'll keep coming across them for a, uh, quite a while. Um, epsilon is think of it as the generalization error of the classifier of the model that you train. Uh, it is actually the bound. It, you want the generalization error to be no more than one, uh, the, sorry, the, the error should be no more than epsilon, meaning your classifier should have a probability of getting the right label to be at least one minus epsilon on any future example. Okay, any future example drawn mm -hmm. from this fixed and unknown distribution over examples that we have agreed uh, that all our examples come from. And delta is going to be the probability that learning fails. Delta is the probability probability that learning fails, what that means is delta is the probability with which your learner has encountered a bad training set. As a result, it has just uh, given a bad classifier. That means learning succeeds with probability 1 minus delta. So these are the two sort of uh, formal parameters that we have um, that we are going to use to define something as path learnable. Given epsilon and delta, we can now start building the game. The only reason, just to kind of uh, remind you about uh, you know things to come uh, or things that we've already covered, the only reason that we can even have any hope that the classifier is going to have low error in the future is because we've already made an assumption that, uh, that I call this a consistent distribution assumption. This is the assumption that your training data and your future examples come from the same distribution. There's some fixed but possibly unknown distribution that generates training examples, and uh, the future is going to be like the past in that future examples are also going to come from the same distribution. If that happens, then we will see that by taking advantage of that assumption, we will build up the rest of the theory. Given all this, let's now define, we are now ready to define pack learnability. Suppose we have a concept class C. C is the set of functions from which nature chooses its uh, target function. And uh, this each function in the concept class takes an example, an instance from the instance space called X, and applies uh, and does whatever it does to produce a label. The label for now is going to be binary. So you have labels that are minus one and one. Let's pre uh, assume that uh, all our instances are n-dimensional. So we have n-dimensional features. And we have a learner, L, the learning algorithm, that is searching over a hypothesis space H to discover a good approximation for the unknown target class. function. It's the same setting that we've always had so far. There's some concept class, there's an instance space which, uh, with n features, and the learner searches over a hypothesis space. We say that this particular learner, L, can, or, or sorry, the concept class C is packed learnable by this algorithm, L, that uses the hypothesis space H if a certain condition holds. The condition is for every function that is in the concept class, meaning that for any hidden function that nature might have chosen, and for any distribution over the instance space. We don't care what the instance space distribution is, no matter how examples are drawn from the instance space, for some fixed epsilon and delta that are small, we have 
the following condition. I'm going to first read it out and then we'll kind of dissect it. Given M examples, sampled independently according to the distribution D, with probability at least one minus delta, the learning algorithm L produces a hypothesis whose error is no more than epsilon. And here, if this condition happens and M, the number of examples that we have, is polynomial in these three quantities, one over epsilon, one over delta, the dimensionality N, and the size of the hypothesis space, we say that the concept class is fact learnable um, by this algorithm under uh, using the hypothesis space H. I just read out a very, very long sentence full of symbols, and it's probably not that comfortable to look at. So let's break this down. The first point that I want to get to talk about is given M examples, where M is a polynomial in 1 over epsilon, 1 over delta, N, and the size of the hypothesis. This is just another way of saying, this is just a, a technical way of saying, given a small enough number of examples, with probability 1 minus delta, at least 1 minus delta, with, pro with high probability, the learner will produce a close approximation of the true function. How close? The approximation of the true, the, the error of this, uh, the, the classifier that the learner picks will be no more than epsilon. And here we define, just to remind you about what error is, I define the error uh, as the generalization error. The error is the probability that the classifier that you, your learner picks, X, disagrees from the true concept F on some example X that's drawn randomly from the same distribution that exists over the examples. Are there any questions now? Yes. Is this delta and epsilon or it comes with the distribution? Yeah, we get to pick epsilon and delta. Yes. The distribution is unknown. Um, I mean, the, the whole thing here is a formal uh, uh, statement. So actually, we don't really pick the numbers. We will say that M is a polynomial. So we, all the theory that we'll build, we'll try to develop a relationship between M, epsilon, delta, N, and the size of H. And if it turns out that M is polynomial in all those other, in, in these, Quantities, we will declare that learn, that uh, concept class to be fact level. So it's in, in in a functional form if m is polynomial in one over epsilon, for example. Did that? Uh, it's okay. That's not a very satisfying. Uh, okay. Uh, that is like... Oh, let's kind of instantiate the epsilon and delta. Yeah, yeah. So let's say that there's an email classifier that has to predict spam and not spam. Uh, D is the distribution that generates emails. Among all possible ways in which you put together strings uh, to produce an instance, the, the distribution D will assign a higher probability to strings that look like emails. So that's your distribution. Let's say that I want a spam classifier that is 99% accurate whose accuracy is at least 99%. That means your epsilon is 0 0.01. What we would like is, if your epsilon is 0 0.01, one over epsilon is 100. So it becomes a little bit awkward to kind of talk in terms of numbers here, because this is actually a formal uh, a, a, a theoretical statement. But what you would like is a num uh, 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 the concept class of email classification because is fact learnable if in as a function of one over epsilon, if the number of examples needed is polynomial. So if you increase the number of, uh, uh, if you increase, let's say your epsilon was 0 0.01. Let's say that you decrease your epsilon and you say that uh, you bring this down to 0 0.001. That means one over epsilon becomes 1000, right? If you if one over epsilon increases by ten, you don't want the number of examples needed to increase exponentially in that. If you can guarantee that somehow, and we've not talked about how, if you can guarantee that, then this is factor. Yes. Um, so what is the probability then? Like you say, what's the high probability? Aha. This thing here. 
Right. So let's talk about that. So I'm going to erase this uh, thing on top. So let's talk about that. Let's say the delta is 0 0.01. Delta is 0 0.01 means that is the amount of failure you are willing to take with, with the learning process itself. The learner depends on a data set. For example, the learner depends on a data set. And let's say that I sample 100 different data sets from this distribution over email. We are willing to acknowledge that one of them could be a bad data set and your learner will fail. Okay, so that's like the probability that you get a... An unrepresentative. Yes. And this is not something we can directly control for, but uh, if you have enough number of examples, the chances that it is not representative becomes lower and lower. Provided they are the, the data is actually sampled from the distribution, right? This is a fundamental fact about uh, sampling. If your sampler is right and if you have sufficient number of examples, it's going to start looking more and more like the two distribution. That's why the confidence of learning increases, meaning delta gets smaller if the number of examples get more, which is why m is polynomially increasing in one over delta. I thought I saw another hand, but I forgot to take note. Yes, you. So we're talking about how we want more examples because it increases our or decreases the probability. Of Sorry, I, I I apologize. I got distracted by a message on on Zoom because uh, there is a mistake here. This is not small. This is large. That was my question. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Given a large enough number of examples, I don't know why I typed small there. Yes. Thank you, Matthew. Um, there's another question. Does this, this does does this, does this not hold over a very large number of examples? It is the same thing. I guess it's uh, it's over a large number of examples. Yes. Um, I mean, small also makes sense because you said the polynomial is small, exponential is large. So yeah, yeah. Small also makes sense. Right. Yeah, that's the problem, right? I mean, uh, the <laughs> only thing that really technically makes sense is what is written here. Given a yeah. sufficient number of examples that is large enough but not larger than necessary. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it bad if it's not necessary? Yes, if it is exponential, that means that it's bad. Too, yeah. It's too many. Yeah. So uh, I'll explain. Let's say that I have a, a, a learner that says, with an exponential number of examples, I will get, give you a classifier that is 99.9% .9 accurate. And uh, I'll do that with uh 99 guarantee like delta is 0 0.1 0 0.01 the problem with that is an exponential number of examples is far too many let's take the uh, let's take uh, the, a concrete example let's say that you have a boolean function let's say you have a boolean function in n features how many examples can exist with boolean functions it's exponential. Yeah. Essentially, what an exponential is, if that number is, if the number of, if the demand that the learner faces is exponential in the dimensionality, then you are essentially saying, saying, show me all examples that can possibly exist in nature, and I will give you a classifier that's perfect. So I don't need to be a learner. I can just build a big database and say that uh, I will look up the answer all every time it comes along. Mm -hmm. So polynomial, that's why I probably wrote small there. Polynomial is just saying it's only polynomial given as uh, given a data set that's only polynomial in these complexity parameters learning will succeed and if that happens we are declaring that this concept class is fact learner other questions i notice also that i only get questions from this cluster here, and so maybe I should start looking at other places. For me, it's natural to just look here, and maybe that's why people ask questions from here. Questions from the far end or this end here. When we uh, came up with the error on a, for our decision tree and anything. So it was uh, around 33% error. I think. Sure. So uh, we will be saying that is not a good enough classifier. Well, it, okay. So the, you're instantiating this in a concrete setting where the error, let's say the error in your homework one, your error was 33%. And epsilon is, a, a, I wouldn't go that far. 
what I would say rather is for that class of functions, this is a property of a class of functions, right? So uh, we have to kind of to answer that question concretely, we need to think about uh, the specific function that might exist in nature. Let's say it came from a decision tree. Then we have to ask ourselves what it takes, how much, how many examples you need to get the error that is necessary. Maybe I only gave you a very small number of examples, and maybe the num the to max this bound, it's polynomial, but it could be large a large polynomial. Maybe to max that bound, I needed to give you have given you a lot more examples. But as we will see, um, as we will kind of imply, but not necessarily see the class of functions that the ID3 algorithm explores is actually not pack learnable, meaning this guarantee will not hold there. But your depth limited decision trees may be pack learnable. And I don't think I'll prove that in the class, but maybe that's going to be a good midterm question. Oh. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but we'll see uh, if, if I get to sufficient uh, uh, through enough material here. But we'll get to the, the point in a bit. Remember that so far, I, I, I don't want you to instantiate this to specific learning algorithms or specific data set because a data set is just one sample from this distribution. A data set is also only one choice of this F. For the concept class to be packed learnable, I need every single function in this imaginary concept class to be learnable. Uh, in nature, you may not be learnable. Okay. What do you mean by that? I, I may not get for all the F, right? You may, in that case, it's not pack learnable. If, if this condition fails for even one of those functions, then it's not pack learnable. I'm defining, essentially, I am assigning a tag to a set of functions and saying this set of functions is good. It's learnable in an easy way. And we are calling it pack learnable, probably approximately correct learnable, because then it lets us build up the theory. There's an interesting uh, thing that I've, com I've completely ignored in this definition here. I've said with a small, with sufficient number of examples, I'm going to replace small and large and just say sufficient. With sufficient number of examples, with high probability, the learner will succeed. Now let's say that uh, I give you a learning algorithm that comes that comes with this guarantee somehow it has this guarantee but in order to meet this guarantee it is going to run from now till the heat death of the universe it's going to run forever it will run for it will never stop running and at the end of time it will return a classifier that's satisfying this property that's not good right so it's we are in the we are in the realm of computer science it's not sufficient just to talk about how much information there is in a data set, we also need to talk about the efficiency point. Mm -hmm. A concept class is efficiently learnable if the time that it takes to achieve all of this, this guarantee is a polynomial in this quantity, in the same set of parameters. So we have these uh, you know, efficient, the set of uh, uh, concept classes, classes that are efficiently packed learnable might be smaller than the full set because maybe there's a there are there's some concept class that is pack learnable but not efficiently pack learnable. Yeah. Uh, could you clarify what it is where it's polynomial and polynomial? Um so I'll give you an example of something that is not polynomial. Two power one over epsilon is not polynomial. Um one over epsilon is a polynomial log one over delta is polynomial. less than polynomial. Mm -hmm. Um, the size of h square is a polynomial. So any so these sorts of things are not allowed. Other questions? Just to kind of look at the exact same thing in a different uh, from a different perspective. For pack learnability, we impose two kinds of restrictions. There is something called the polynomial sample complexity. This is a phrase we've not encountered so far. Sample complexity is asking, how many examples do you need to achieve that epsilon delta guarantee with high probability 
uh, you'll have error less than epsilon. So sample complexity is just a number of examples that are needed to for learning to succeed. This is an information theoretic constraint. It just says, given this set of examples with high probability, you can be certain that you got the right answer, given only these many examples. So is there enough information in these many examples to be for us to be able to tell apart the true function from other functions? That's the sample complexity. There's the poly the passage also in requires a polynomial time complexity. This is a computational constraint. It's not just about is there any information in the data? Is the algorithm, is there an efficient algorithm that can actually process all this data and digest it? And produce the learner, uh, produce the classifier uh, efficiently. So we need both of these aspects uh, for pack learnable. And usually, when I say pack learnable, I mean both of these things. But uh, you know, in places like exam questions and such things, we will kind of just mostly focus on sample complexity. Why? Because you learn all about time complexity in uh, other classes like algorithms. Which is all about how, how long do uh, programs run for? Or what's the time complexity? A uh, sample complexity is something a, a notion that shows up only in machine learning. So we'll focus more on that. Uh, related to the question that came up, for 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 a concept class to be pack learnable, there must be a hypothesis with whose error is are less than any epsilon, any epsilon that I choose for every single function in the concept class. Um, for now, the, the, we'll assume that the hypothesis class H contains, this is H, contains the concept class. Uh, sometimes we see the phrase properly fact learnable, which where uh, the learner knows the concept class and the hypothesis class it then searches is exactly the same as the concept class. Then we say it's properly fact learnable. It's just these these are these are just words. I have just been all I have been doing so far is defining things. I have not shown you any reason to believe that this definition is meaningful or this definition, any of these definitions characterize anything non-trivial. I will show examples um, and prove uh, we, we will look at some uh, a, a theorem on back learnability, actually a few of them. But so far, all I have done is just define concept classes as fact learnable or not. It's just a tag associated with sets of functions. Yes. Um, so we say there has to be some sample complexity in the hypothesis, which is part of our hypothesis space. Mm -hmm. um, with small error for every function in the Class? Yes. So, I don't understand that. So, so let's. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you an example. Let's consider the case where this is your concept class, meaning every dot here is a function. And then let's say this is your hypothesis class. There is not a single function in your hypothesis class that perfectly, that, that is in the concept class, right? That means, no matter what the true concept is, let's say nature decides that the true concept is this dot right here. Mm -hmm. There is no way that you will have, uh, uh, you have guaranteed zero error. In fact, we might just be unlucky. We might even be guaranteed very high error because these sets of functions might be so far apart. Let's say, for instance, I have a concept class that uh, is all possible conjunct. Uh, in two variables. And my hypothesis class is the function that takes two variables, ignores all of them, and always returns uh, zero. There is one conjunction that does that. For every, everything else, there's going to be a higher. So it's possible that our concept class may not contain the true hypothesis. But for now, I'm assuming, just for now, I'm assuming that H contains C. That means the search space for the, for the learner, which is the hypothesis space, contains all the functions that uh, might actually show up in nature. This is a very strong assumption because we don't even know what the true concept class is. 
this is basically saying here is the investigation cost function as well. Yes. And properly packed manual is we have chosen just right, meaning H and C are the same set. So that's properly packed manual. And honestly speaking, I think the only reason we have these things at the bottom is because we can kind of progress up in classes and write papers about them. Because in nature, I have no idea what set of functions nature uses to decide whether an email is spam or not. So nature is more like this. And that setting is called the agnostic learning setting where we don't make assumptions about uh, the learner uh, being able to successfully find any true function. We'll talk about agnostic learning after the spring break. Pack learning is a worst case definition. The algorithm must meet its accuracy bound, namely the accuracy should be at least one minus epsilon for every single distribution that nature might choose over the instance space. It does not, it cannot assume that it cannot, you cannot have an algorithm that says I will work only for these kinds of uh, data and not for that other kind of data. Maybe you can, you will just not call the thing pack learner. Uh, also, it's worst case about uh, the target function. Every single target function must be possible. There are, there's a question in Zoom. Uh, what is the size of H? It's simply the number of functions in the hypothesis space. So it's a worst case definition with respect to both the distribution over examples and the choice of the target function. Yes. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, we spoke about two cases we had with the third part and the uh, Yes. Here, when we talk about accuracy, it seems to be only focused on each zone. Yes. You know the third part. Yeah. Third part? Uh, delta is a, a delta will show up uh, in the theory. Uh, we, will, we will actually get there very soon. Is there a question? You seem very happy. So you're pointing at something, so. Yes. I'm having a hard time trying to get to it, um, every distribution being possible. Could we like, does that allow like an adversarial uh, selection of examples? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, uh, interesting question. Assuming, that the distribution, let, let me kind of uh, build it up uh, from scratch. Let's say that we have an instance space. Okay, let's uh, let's take the example from uh, the first lecture, the badges game. Um, the input consists of um, names, but actually really the input consists of two strings. One of them is called the first name, the second one is called the last name. Okay, there are certain pairs of strings that are in nature, more likely to be names, right? But let's say that I build a learning algorithm and I say that that learning algorithm the, that decides whether some name is positive and is labeled plus or minus only works for a particular distribution over the strings that matches what nature has, that the current distribution. But that learning algorithm only works for the existing distribution. Maybe there's a different learning problem where we are given two strings and we have to decide some property of those two strings. You, this algorithm that you invent no longer works there. So the constraint is uh, the algorithm for it to be fact learnable over the concept class should work for any distribution over the string. And not for, it should not make any assumption that nature is going to, uh, the, the, the distribution of the instances comes from. Given that, there's a constraint. The constraint is that once at the beginning of the process, let's say when we have defined the problem, we've somehow agreed upon a distribution that we don't have access to, but let's say the distribution is frozen. After that, nature does not have the luxury of changing that distribution. Nature has to draw examples from that distribution because the distribution is fixed. It's unknown. We don't know what the distribution is, but it's fixed. So that's the only constraint. So it's, it's kind of, it's nature's hands are tied. It cannot be adversarial in that after learning has started, it now says, 
the distribution of names in the universe has changed mm -hmm. because now we've gone to a different universe, so it's no longer. But at the beginning of the learning process, it the distribution could be any. That's why it is for everything. Okay. Yes. Did you have a question? Yes. If my hypothesis is a fact, can I thought of the have my my hypothesis is which one will we will actually be proving a statement about overfitting. Essentially, we'll be saying that if you have these many examples, there will be uh, the, in fact, this accuracy guarantee, right? This epsilon that I define is about generalization error. If the true, if the generalization error or true error, epsilon, uh, it, it, if the error of the classifier is less than epsilon, that means it's not overfitting. It's the whole point of fact learnability is about overfitting. It's the, the theorem that the, the statement or the, the definition of fact learnability that we uh, made that we saw talks about the uh, overfitting uh, because it says your classifier is going to make uh, the true error of the classifier is going to be less than epsilon. The true error of the classifier is simply the probability that it makes an error in a future example chosen uh, from the distribution or in any example from the, from the distribution. And if that is low, then it's not overfit. 